What happens when Paul goes to Athens? That's what we're going to find out in X-17. Well, we are in the midst of Paul's journeys. It's interesting. I spent the week trying to figure out who Paul is. I mean, not that we can know until we get to heaven, but he seems serious, seems very smart, very educated. He knows how to adjust to people. He looks for every opportunity, goes where it can work, you know, where he can speak to people. And when he can't, he leaves. He knows people he can trust in. I think that he seems like a very serious man. And just as a side note, I was trying to figure out, so I watched a few movies about Paul. Not that that can tell me who Paul is or was, but it was interesting. There was a movie that was called Paul, Apostle of Christ. It was fine. I'm watching it. And it's about how Luke visits Paul in prison. At the very end, Paul dies. And when he goes to heaven, he sees all the people he killed coming to greet him in heaven. And who lost it? I was like, oh man. I don't know how Paul ended up in heaven and what happened to him when he got there, but to be greeted by the very people you martyred. Wow. You know, I thought that's such a stunning testament. And like I said, we don't know, but it's just kind of a cool moment. But he must have been tough and he must have been fairly good shape because of all the miles he's traveling. I did a hundred mile hike in England over the course of eight days and it darn near killed me. <laughs> so he had a bit in some very good shape. But it says that Paul ended up in Thessalonica and Thessalonica is almost like partially the way around towards Athens, but we'll, we'll get there soon. And it says that he passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia. So he spoke in the synagogues, first to the Jews, as was the custom. On the three Sabbaths day, he reasoned with them from Scripture. So he's trying to show them, see where it says here, this is Jesus. See where it says here, Jesus was going to suffer. This is who I'm talking to you about. These events were mentioned in the Old Testament. What you believe in, and he was raised from the dead, and he is the Christ. He is the Messiah. And it said some were uh, persuaded to join. Paul and Silas, and they had also so many devout Greeks. And it says, and not a few of the leading women. There's that negative again, <laughs> that meaning quite a few Greek women. And so he is using the Old Testament to compare it to what Jesus did. These are all the places, almost like a, like a Matthew. These are the prophecies, and this is how Jesus fulfilled them. He would know he was a Pharisee. He was educated in all these items. This was hard for the Jewish people. Because in their mind, like I said during the Gospels, they imagined a Messiah was coming to restore David's kingdom, to kick out these awful Romans, and to restore this nation. They missed all the passages about the suffering servant. And we do that as human beings. We have an image of what something is going to be. And anything that doesn't fit that image, we toss it out. Not just about Jesus, but about a lot of things. It caused some of them not to believe. And it says that people, you know, resented it. Some of the Jews were jealous, it said. And I don't think they were jealous of Paul. They were jealous that this message was going out to everybody, that Jesus was about everybody coming back to God. And so it says it took some wicked men of the rabble, you know, so they got a mob going. And they got the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason. Jason is where they were staying, seeking to bring out them out, to, you know, trying to haul out Paul and Silas to the crowd. And when they couldn't find him, they dragged Jason out and some of the brothers, and they were shouting. They were explaining, these men are, are turning everything upside down. They are wrecking everything. We believe in God. He looks like this. The synagogue has the power to do things. The synagogue in Jerusalem has the power to do things. This is not how it was supposed to be. But again, I think that they were missing a great deal of scripture about Jesus. They were seeing the kind of Messiah they wanted to get, not the Messiah they did get. They wanted a kingdom on earth and not a kingdom in heaven. People were upset about this whole thing and they took money from Jason as a security deposit. Oh boy. Paul and Silas went to Berea, another city. Things were getting hot there. The brothers immediately sent them, you know, things, things aren't great here. So they went to the Jewish synagogues again, because first to the Jews, and it says that these Jews were more normal than those in Thessalonica. 
And they were eager to look at the scripture with them, sort of investigate what was going on. They weren't just yelling or they just weren't shouting their opinion or they weren't trying to get a mob against them. In this case, they were like, okay, let's look all this up. This would be the Old Testament because scripture at that time was the Old Testament. So they examined it. They investigated it. And it says then they believed and with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men with not many, many, many Greek women. I wish you would not use those negatives. They're tying me up. So when the Jews of Thessalonica heard that they were in Berea, well, then they came there too. They were going to fix this. And again, the brothers immediately sent Paul off to the way of the sea. But Silas and Timothy remained in Berea. And, and those people who were with Paul took him as far as Athens. And then after receiving, it says, the command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they left to were Athens. It says that Berea was about 55 miles southwest of Thessalonica. So Paul was waiting for him in Athens. And it says that his spirit was provoked from within him. <laughs> he saw the whole city is full of idols because, of course, it was Athens. The Greeks had so many gods. And I think that it was true of any of these imperial nations, right? Babylon, we're just going to take in all your gods. Athens too. So the more areas they conquered, they just accumulated gods. I saw some show and he was worried something was happening. And they said, well, did you try this other God? Maybe that other God would help you. You know, it says he reasoned in the synagogue. It means he talked in, in a rational, reasonable way, I'm going to explain these things to you. And to devout people in the marketplaces, you know, I'm going to try to explain what's going on in a very reasoned way. Of course, Athens is going to be kind of the, the place of the great philosophers. What happened with religion, you know, way back in the day, they get sacked by Rome. And it is still considered to be sort of the, I don't know, the elder wise city of now the Roman Empire. It wasn't in its heyday. It wasn't the top, but it was educated. It was philosophical. And they had many different followings. We've heard of some of those. Stoicism. Stoicism is we're going to grit it out. We're going to gut it out. We're not going to get overwhelmed by emotion. But now Stoics tend to be very atheistic. Or there is actually a whole group of Christians that like the Stoic mentality. I happen to be one of them. But at that time, they were very pagan religious. They believed all the gods and it was a very Greek religion kind of thing. So he goes there and it says that some of the Epicureans, that's another philosophy, the Epicureans, you know, now we look at Epicureans as people who like the finest things in life, the finest meals and the finest homes. Back then it was less about the ultimate fine thing and more that they just wanted peace, no trouble, they were people who enjoyed kind of the pleasures and joys and relaxations of life. It was a little bit different than it is today. And he talked to them, too. And they're like, what is this guy talking about? He seems to be some foreign guy, some foreign preacher. And he's talking about Jesus and this resurrection. So they brought him to the Areopagus, which is where people went to. Think of it like an old TED Talk, you know. We went there to discuss new ideas, new exciting ideas. We want to think about something really thrilling and something we never heard before, something like that. They were excited about that kind of thing. Just like I said, just like people at TED Talks, they want to hear something new and exciting about how the future is going to look or a new way of thinking at things. It wasn't that they were looking to convert. They just were excited for something new and something strange, and they were excited about that. And the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there got a chance to listen to Paul. Now, this is, I think, the thing that makes Paul the most interesting piece of it is when he's talking to the synagogues, I'm going through the Old Testament. I am showing you this chain of how it went from here and what was prophesied about the Messiah and how we got here. If he's going to talk to a bunch of Greeks in Athens, they don't care about any of that. Like I said in the Gospels, Athens and Rome considered the Jewish areas and the Canaanite areas to be backwards. They like new ideas. They don't want ideas from the beginning of the creation of mankind. They want something fresh. And so Paul has to think about how am I going to talk to this group? You know, Athens is where we have democracy, where we got literature and world ideas. And like I said, Rome honored it, but it was no longer the city they went to. And it 
loved wisdom, but not to the point where it would talk them out of their idols. I think that they just saw no reason to give up their many gods. It's all looking for us. If we want rain, we pray this way. And if we want literature, we pray this other way. They didn't see any reason to pick or choose. This is just a fresh place for ideas and all sorts of them. So Areopagus means Mars Hill. You'll, you'll hear there's churches. There's a church, a famous one called Mars Hill. This is the place where in Greek mythology, Hephaestus took Mars, Ares, and put him on trial for killing one of his children, I believe. This was just a big, gigantic rock, like outcropped on this giant hill. So that was the place where all the people who wanted to hear these fresh ideas went to. At one time, it was the high court of Athens, a place for leadership. But like I said, Athens is no longer the city of it. So it's now ideas and leisure and TED Talk. Isn't it kind of funny? I think of myself, too, as I was the person who just loved new ideas. I wanted to hear new ideas for the sake of hearing new ideas. Not that I was going to believe your ideas. If I met a Buddhist, I would talk all day long to this Buddhist. I wanted you to tell me what it was you believe. Not because I was personally looking to become a Buddhist, but I was just interested in what you were talking about. That's why when I was in Israel, I talked to everybody about their experience here, their faith, what this place means to them. So it's just so curious about something like that. I just want knowledge. And I kind of think that that's what this Areopagus was about too. Boy, comparing myself to the Areopagus, but I, I was that person. So he says, look, I noticed that a lot of you are religious, meaning religion in you following all sorts of gods. You have all these worships and altars, all, uh, uh, but I found an inscription to an unknown God. The story behind that is at one point there was a plague, and I think they let sheep run through the city, and any place a sheep would stop, if it was an altar to a God, they would kill it in the name of that God. But whenever it stopped not near an altar, they would kill it, put up an altar to the unknown God. And so he decides he's going to take something that they would understand, not the Old Testament scripture, not the prophecies or anything else like that. He's not going to speak lies to them, but he's going to say, you know what? I'm going to tell you who this unknown God is. I'm going to proclaim this to you. It is the God who made the world and everything in it, the Lord of heaven and earth. He doesn't live in temples made by people. He's not created by human hands like your idols. He has given all of mankind the breath of life. He created us all. And he made one man so everyone, no matter where you are, no matter what nation you live in, that they should seek God, feel their way towards him, and find him. It's interesting in other translations, and all the translations, I think, are correct in this. New Kings James, they should seek the Lord in the hope that they may grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each of us. NIV, God did this so they would seek him and perhaps reach out to him and find him, though he is not far from any of us. This is such an intriguing statement. I mean, out of all the things that I think Paul has said, because when we think about God being preached to the whole world, to everyone knowing God, we think of it as you might read the Old Testament and you read the New Testament and you understand who Jesus is. I think what he's saying here is he is not far from us. He is someone that everybody can reach to, everyone can get to. Whether they've seen the Old Testament, whether they've seen the New Testament, he is right at your fingertips. And in creating Adam, everyone's descended from Adam. All the nations, everywhere, every kind of people. You know, and, and, and nations, they come and go. Civilizations come and go. Athens is the place that saw its glory, who created us all. He wants us to seek him. You know, seek, not find, right? He wants us to do that. And I think that means God is self-evident. God is out there in the world and you can reach him. And he, he reaches to us. He's always the God reaching to us. In the end, we're all his children. And being God's children, we shouldn't think that anything divine is gold, silver, stone, physical things, our art. Because, boy, you said that, that's, that's fighting words, right? Because they love their art. This is a quote from ESV. The time of ignorance, God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day 
in which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. So he, he brings stuff they know all together to this point. This is all about Jesus. Now, I mentioned before that the Jews were mad be, in some cases because this message was for everyone, or in some cases because their power was going to be taken away from them as being the true believers in God. But what was it for this group that was on Mars Hill? It was the resurrection of the body. A lot of the Greeks had this idea that the spirit was pure, but our, our flesh corrupts us. This is where one of the first heresies came out that Jesus never was born in the body, never died in the body, never resurrected because any physical body is evil, is, is something to be trashed. There, that was their stumbling. I think we all have stumbling blocks, right? We hear a Christian and say, yeah, I want the forgiveness of God. Oh, wait, but I have to give up living with my boyfriend? No, oh, no, thanks then. Or we say, well, wait a minute. You know, I've been making money by, you know, stealing from my boss, but you're telling me now I can't steal from my boss? Think about all the time that Jesus would say, oh, yeah, you can follow me, but, you know, I don't really have a house. Or, yeah, you can follow me, but you should leave right now. Well, I, I, I want to go say, you know, goodbye to my father and all that. Nope, nope, come now, come now. There's always that thing that just trips people up. And Paul is going after it now, saying the one thing that's going to trip them up, which is the resurrection of the body. But then they started mocking him. But others said, you know, we want to hear more from you. We want to hear you again. Paul left from their midst. And some of the men, it says, joined and believed. And one of them was Dionysus. So he was from the area and a woman named Amaris. There were people who actually joined him, who heard this and it spoke to them. It's interesting because they didn't persecute him, right? This is a TED Talk. They just all walked away and went, huh, and I don't believe that. Or they were indifferent to it. They just walked away from the whole piece of it. But some people did believe. And that ends Acts 17. What I'm going to meditate on is how Paul talked to people where they were at. He wasn't going to talk about Messiatic Judaism to a bunch of Greeks in Athens. He wasn't going to talk to Jewish people about Greek gods, right? He talks to people, and he is so smart because he understood all of this. You could tell he was very educated that he understood what he was reading and seeing in Athens, and he knew how to take it. Not lying, not turning his words so it could be different to different groups of people, but instead starting from where they're at. Boy, I'm going to meditate on what a fantastic ability Paul had to do that. And what I'm going to pray about is the fact that I never get into this place where I have a speech for Jesus. Or you, you, you've seen people like that, right? They go door to door and say, so if you were going to die tomorrow, do you know where you would go? And it's the same speech for everyone. Instead, I pray that the Holy Spirit gives me that ability to understand where people are at and then talk to them in a way that they would understand the message of God. And what I'm going to share with others is exactly that. I want to share the word of God to other people in a way they get, in a way that makes sense to them, so that they can understand God, even if there's going to be some oh, places where they trip up because they have an understanding of the way the world works, and it goes against that. You know what? You got to say it anyway. Being a Christian is about saying the truth, but also how Paul talked to people in a matter they would get. I, I want to share the message of God in that same way. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember that you can go to abetterlifeinsmallsteps.com. It's a link in the show notes. My friend M is writing a blog there. It's meant to be fun and kind of provide joy in life. And it also has a list of all the other podcasts and blogs we have. So please check it out. M is the one who brought me to faith in Christ. So we've been friends a really long time. Hope you give it a shot and hope it's interesting to you. 